Hello, hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Jonah from Spotlight, and today it is day two. We are joined by Thomas and Felipe. How are you doing today, folks? I'm doing really, really good. Excellent. Awesome. Doing great. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. I love, we don't do this often, but this week we are doing three events yesterday, today, and tomorrow, diving deep into how to create 3D art free and fast. Before we get started, just want to get a couple things out of the way. If you're here, please hop in the comments. Let us know where you're tuning in from, maybe something you're excited to learn, how you heard about Thomas, how you heard about Felipe, any of those things. And if you're watching the replay, please do the same. We love hearing all of those things. Believe it or not, we do come back and look at those comments. And also, if you have any questions throughout the event, Hop in the comments, ask your questions. If we don't answer you right away, we are not ignoring you. We've set aside time at the end specifically for a Q&A. So pop them in there. If we don't get to them right away, pop them in again. We'll try and get to all of those questions. And last but not least, if you have to get up away from the computer, things are moving fast, you want to come review some of the stuff we're getting into today, don't fret. There will be a replay. It'll be here on YouTube on the Spotlight event page, and it'll also be emailed to you along with the course offer, which we'll talk about a little later. And just to make sure everyone's in the right place, like I said, we are talking to Thomas and Felipe. We're talking about how to create 3D art free and fast. And today we're going to be specifically diving in to the Blender tool and expanding more on that. I know you two know way more about this than I do. So I'm going to get out of the way and hand it over to you. Cool. Um, well, I appreciate you having us, Jonah. Welcome back, everybody who was with us yesterday. Welcome to everybody who's new. Um, today's going to be really, really fun. We're going to focus on Thor's hammer inside of Blender. So even better. Um, I am with Felipe, and Felipe is my studio's 3D modeler. Um, my studio has made uh, two commercial releases, plenty of games, but two commercial releases that are on pretty much every platform. And our third commercial release is 3D, but the important thing is it's independent, right? I'm an indie studio, and I know a lot of you are probably interested in indie game development. So what we're going to do is we're going to create Thor's Hammer, and we're going to make it fast. We're going to make it free. And really, I mean, it's, it's all about making it cheap, making it quickly. Most of us don't have a week to make a weapon like AAA studios do, right? And so Felipe is really talented at this. He can make something look gorgeous really fast. So we're going to do this in about 20 minutes. That's I know right. it said 60 minutes here. That's because Felipe is going to show you actually a time lapse of him creating this hammer um, in a total of 60 minutes, but he, he, he sped it up a little bit and he's going to talk through how you can do it too. By the way, Felipe, how are you doing, man? I'm doing great. I'm super excited to show you guys the result of this one. And like Thomas said, you know, it's... Uh, you can take a week to make something, but sometimes you can't afford to do that. You just have to crank up something real cool and uh, really quickly. And this will be a great example of how you can achieve that with just some basic knowledge, really, and some good eye, I guess. Yep, yep. And and you definitely have that, man. Um, mm -hmm. So here's a quick overview of today's webinar. There's three sort of points we're going to hit. Um, the first one is when you're modeling anything, it doesn't matter whether it's AAA or it's indie but especially indie games, everything is a basic shape, what you would call a primitive shape, okay? So for the example, uh, Thor's hammer, I mean, you could probably guess what the primitive shape would be. It's just a cube, right? And in fact, Felipe right now is working on creating a beautiful breathtaking scene mimicking Elden Ring with just squares. We're gonna be posting this on my YouTube channel. So you can make beautiful scenes with just primitive shapes. You can make beautiful objects like Thor's hammer, starting out with just a primitive shape. And you use a variety of techniques that Felipe is going to talk about, including beveling, ex extruding, insetting, loop cuts, to slowly model it as if it was clay. We're also going to talk about meshes, what a mesh is, polygons, all that cool stuff. And then third, we're actually going to finish off the model. We're not going to get into a ton of detail here, but Flippy wants to show you what the final product is going to look like. And he sent it to me, and it's beautiful. And what's so cool is it's it's just fast. It's quick, and it's fast. 
and again, free, which is the most important thing. That's really, really important. I know for you guys, because most of us don't have a lot of time and cash because we're indie game, indie game developers. So we don't have that, those resources. So free and fast is always a good thing. So again, everything is a basic shape. All right. So Thor's hammer here, really, it's just a cube and then a little cylinder. That's about it. So Felipe, do you want to go ahead and get started here and show us how we can start with a primitive shape and suddenly make Thor's hammer? Absolutely. Yes. Let's get on with this one here. It's going to be amazing. Hopefully you guys enjoy it. And I'm going to be pausing throughout the video as well, because like Thomas said, it's sped up. So originally this took about 60 minutes. We're going to look into that for maybe about 20, 25 minutes here. Um, and hopefully you guys will get some good tips from, from this and some good knowledge as well. So let's get started here with this video. Um, you know, the, the great thing about Thor's hammer, and I'm going to pause right here, is that this is a very popular thing, right? And when you're working off trying to reproduce something that exists and it's really ingrained in people's minds at this point in time, you're going to probably going to be really easy for you to find good references. And you want to work off with a good reference. And thankfully, there's a lot of the cosplayers and people dedicated to make sure that they map all the visuals of these movies and like in these objects. Uh, so this is great. Like Thor's Hammer was probably like one of the, the best options to, to get started. So if you find something like this, to work off that's you're in heaven that's heaven for the for a 3d artist right there so another cool thing about blender as well is that it's not a unique thing about blender but the fact that you can just literally grab a say a psd file or a png image and you just drag and drop into the viewport and there you go it's already set in a plane for you and then you can just use it to model on top of it and you know we're gonna go in the course like in more more in depth about like how to model using a reference but in a nutshell that's really it you want to set up like some planes you know and then you just going to model on top of it you know which is really easy and cool so like thomas was saying you know we start off with very basic primitives right and by primitives we mean cubes spheres cylinders cones like a lot of different shapes that are very basic that blender think thankfully provides us right there from the get-go, right? So Thor's hammer started off with a cube. And then we just start scaling it and placing around like where we need things to be. So right now we just did a loop cut. In a loop cut, it really is just really about cutting a model. So like we have more vertices to work from and work off. And that's really what I did here. Like we just added two loop cuts in each on the top and on the bottom so we can move those vertices later and start giving it a bit more shape. And, you know, we came a long way when it comes to performance in games and on anything that uses 3D, too. So a lot of people would probably want to want, would want to model this as a one-piece thing. But nowadays, you can just go and make different cubes you know, and, and then edit them and shape them around so that they will get to the final result. You can just do that nowadays, and it's really not that much costly in terms of performance. And, you know, this is a weapon that is really cool. It's very important for the game, we're assuming, uh, if you were to make a game like this. And uh, you want it to be as detailed as you can get without going into the high poly territory. And by high poly, I mean high poly count. Poly count, this kind of modeling is a poly modeling, which is using polygons to do it. There's some other types of modeling, but this one specifically uses uh, polys. And polys, uh, they take on the hardware, they take on processing power, right? So back on the N64, the PlayStation 1 era, things were a little bit tough. And the reason why you saw a lot of things looking rather squarish and not, not so great, not so smooth, is because, you know, processing power was not there yet. Um, it's much better. We came a long way, as I like to keep saying. But you still want to be mindful of these things, especially on an indie context, right? You don't want to go full on into this because you know that's your audience sometimes you're going to be making a game for mobile so that's those are important things for you to keep in mind right so the way that this hammer is being done here it's still indie friendly which which is the good thing and right now i'm just really doing oh sorry about that <laughs> i'm just really doing uh very basic operations here right i've done some insets so i, I selected these four faces 
and I'm just carving into them, right, to give us more faces to work from. And then we just do an extrude, which is another very basic operation, which essentially just means pushing into your face and then creating more faces to work with. And all of these operations, they're adding more polys, right? They're adding more poly count to your model at the end. So it's something for you to be mindful of. But right now, it's still pretty okay. And a loop cut, uh, just going back to what I said before, these thing, this this operation also allows you to do more complex modeling. It's the bread and butter of modeling, really, loop cuts. Loop cut, I mean, you created a loop around an object, so in this case, a cube, and now you have vertices connecting each of these points that you just created. So again, you can modify this shape a little bit more. So on Thor's Hammer, we have that line, the little detail there. We want to make sure that we incorporate that as well. And then we can do what is called a bevel. So a bevel takes, say, an edge loop, or it can be just one edge as well. And it just expands. It basically just duplicates that, and it keeps that same average ratio of distance between them. And then you can do insets there. You can do extrudes with that. It's just a brand new face that you can just use to work with, which is, again, awesome. And, you know, like I said earlier, it's great when you have awesome reference like this, but sometimes you don't. And, you know, sometimes you're working on a thing that not a lot of people know about, or it's just like a, you're trying to use it as an inspiration for something, and you only have a really not so great angle, like a photo or like that is kind of like blurred and stuff like that. So when is that? When that's the case, I normally like to look up for like similar stuff, you know, like uh, if I was to model Thor's hammer and I didn't have this reference and there was nothing out there, which is impossible, but let's imagine there wasn't. I would look up for medieval uh, hammers, right? I would look up old Norse mythology drawings and like all that stuff because that's really it that you have to work off with. And then you got to be a little bit creative too, right? You got to like play around with it. And as, as long as it fits that design, as long as it doesn't go get away too much from what you're trying to do, then it's okay, right? So here, we're going to start making the hilt. So the hilt is composed by a couple different parts. There's that metal one there that is holds that junction that holds the, the big block, which is the hammer and the hilt. And just doing very basic things, you know, like I did like a, a bevel there, an inset, an extrude. We just keep repeating those things. It's almost like you only need to know these three and probably loop cut, and you can just do a lot. And again... We're almost done with the hammer by itself, and it's only been three minutes of this footage. I'm guessing about like 10 minutes of actual modeling, right? So really cool stuff. And just going to be using a cylinder, cylinder there on the top for that cap and let's make probably another one for the hilt and you know I'm using a cylinder that is 32 sides 32 faces which can be quite a lot you know especially for a low poly low poly count model but you know again this is a weapon that the player might see from a first person perspective or a third person perspective it's a big deal my guess is that if you're going to make Thor's hammer into a game or something similar to that, there's not going to be 10 hammers, right? It just looks just like this one, unless that's what you're going for. So you can make it pretty unique and add a lot of detailing to it. And I think you can get away with weapons a lot because they're very iconic. They're very important for your game if that's the kind of game that you're making, right? So it's okay to do 32. Normally, if you're going to make something that is not so important, maybe you're going to use a 12-sided cylinder or 16 or maybe even 20, which is a little bit overkill already. But, you know, I think you got, I think you get what I mean. And for the rings, like the metal rings that you see there, I use the cylinder as well. But because they are angled in this kind of like V-shape um, thing, you know, there's a lot of really cool um, tools that Blender offers you to quickly 
you know, iterate and just change it up as you need. So like right now I'm using what's called a lattice modifier. If you are, if you come from a 3ds max background, if you've done 3d before, this is the same thing as the FFD box modifier, which is great because it allows you to move vertices around, keeping the same, um, ratio and distance between them. So like you can just quickly modify a shape and respecting that, uh, that distance between the, the the vertices, which is awesome. This is another great thing here as well that I think it's important to cover up is, and we're talking about, about a lot of things here, but again, this is one of those very important things that we need to make sure that we understand is that if a player is never gonna see the back faces of an object, so let's say you have a cube that it touches on a different object and like that back face that is connecting, that is colliding with the, the bigger object, that's never gonna be seen by the player, right? Unless you wanna make that object destructible, but that's a different thing. But if they're never gonna see it, you probably wanna delete those faces. And that's a practice that even though, like I said, nowadays performance is much better in hardware, you still wanna make sure that you're doing that because Sure, maybe one little object is not going to make a huge difference if you clean it up, because I consider that cleaning up a mesh. You probably, you know, in a very complex model, let's say a car or like a tank or like a realistic weapon, you want to get rid of polys or faces, right? As much as you can, right? And that's a great example here with the ring. You know, nobody's going to see the interior of the ring. So you want to make sure you're deleting those, those faces there. Ah, and this is one of my favorite modifiers in Blender called Array. Array allows you to literally make an array of like an object, like a 3D model that you created. So I just counted how many rings are on that hilt, added the, the modifier, kind of calculated a distance that I felt was good enough. And there you go. You don't need to make each ring again or try to position them exactly the same. It's just awesome, you know, Blender. And 3D models, like 3D tools, like have a lot to offer to help you with efficiency as well, right? And you should take advantage of that. So when it comes to the pommel of the hammer here, this bottom part, uh, I wanted to do something that resembled a little bit more what you see in the movie. Right now, the reference that we have is actually a little bit different, it's a little bit more simpler. And this is probably the most complex uh, model uh, object uh, or part of this uh, hammer, actually. Uh, and we're going to see why in a little bit. But, you know, sometimes, you know, going back to finding good references and things like that, sometimes you might find a reference that is great for a certain, a certain angle or they might not be 100% accurate. So, you know, you just need to look up other images. And that's what I did in this case, right? I, looked up a couple of other images of uh, of the movies and things like that and real prop recreations and uh and there you go great thing as well about 3D and I think there was a joke made by someone yesterday in the first webinar you know the mirror modifier is an essential thing too because you know you can do modeling and not worry about one side. You're just doing because it's going to be symmetrical, right? The same sides are going to be the same. So you just delete the faces in one side, apply the mirror modifier, and there you go. You know, the other side is taken care of. You don't need to model it again. You don't need to worry about, oh, is this vertex in the same position as the other one? Just throw the mirror modifier, you know? I'm just, in this case here, deleting the faces inside the pommel, just like we said, to save on the poly count. And just continuing to make some extrusions and scaling things around. So in this case here, this is a, I'm actually going to go back a little bit here because this is a this is a very important thing. I was kind of waiting for a specific moment in the video to talk about this. Every every model, like I said, because this is a poly modeling uh, technique, every model has faces, and uh, at least most of them. I can't think about something that doesn't have one, and they will be composed by edges, right? And, you know, by default, if you're going to work from the primitives that Blender offers you, you're going to see cubes, you're going to see cylinders, and they all should be using quads, right, for the most part. Quads means faces that are, you know, basically a square, right? They have four edges to them. 
sometimes you use triangles, which are three-faced, uh, three-edged uh, faces, right? And the thing about triangles, and if you know anything about 3D or if you might have heard about it, people tend to not like triangles a lot, but sometimes they are necessary. This is an example where it's a little bit easier to just use triangles because this top here is going to be flat. So even if there's some deformation on the mesh, let's say you start pulling some um, some vertices around, it's not going to modify that because it's, it's going to remain flat. So there's it's okay to use triangles. But in most most of the, 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 the situations, you want to use quads because they offer uniformity, right? It's a quad. It's perfect square or perfect square-like shapes. Like maybe it can be a rectangle, but it still has four edges. So that's something important as well for you to know when you're coming in into the polymodeling world. That being said, there are examples where you can or maybe it's okay to use um, faces that have more than four edges, right? And those are called endgons. And it could be, you know, 5, 6, 10, 15, 200 uh, edges, which is quite crazy. And I don't recommend personally, but, you know, it's something that you can do if you need to. Um, it's kind of hard to come up with an example right now where that would be okay. But, you know, I think if you continue on this journey, you're going to notice that, you know, sometimes it's almost necessary to use them too. So here I'm just mirroring the hammer. You know, again, don't have to worry about the other side. That's the cool thing about it. And for the leather strap, now this is not in the reference as well, but we know that Thor in the movies and I guess in other contexts as well, he uses the leather strap to, you know, use the hammer. They just like spin it and just hit the bad guy. And I use the cylinder for this, and you can see why, because you can just quickly modify that shape and using the lattice modifier, the same one that we use for the, the rings, the metal rings in the hilt, you can just quickly make something that looks a little bit organic, I guess. Um, if you were to simulate cloth or things that are kind of like cloth, you probably would want to do that in the game engine, so say Unity or Unreal Engine. Um, or I do that in the character animations, right? But because this is kind of like a statue of sorts, it's kind of like a frozen in time piece, it's kind of okay for us to do this. Um, and just kind of try to give it like a some sort of like organic shape to it so it doesn't look too flat, it doesn't look too unrealistic, I guess. Here are... I'm applying the lattice modifier again because I kind of wanted to give it a little bit of like a, a curve in some parts as well. Again, just trying to simulate that, you know, realism of sorts to just not to just to make it a little bit more interesting to see. And this is very simple. Again, we took a cylinder, we applied some modifiers to it, we're moving vertices around. Nothing crazy here. It's just knowing what your design is asking you to do. And just applying those basic principles and you know it's uh a lot of it comes from also studying objects around you you know you can look at a tv you can look at like your cell phone and you can kind of start imagining like what are the primitives that would compose that what would be the operations that i would be using to get to that shape right so i, I like to give that as an example like so say like a cell phone for example you would use probably a cube but like you see that the, the cell phone sometimes is a little bit round here, right? So you have a cube, then you have an edge here on the top. You can use a bevel, for example. And now you just duplicated or, or added three or four variations to that edge. And now you have something round, right? Here, we also do the process of naming the assets, the models themselves, because if you're doing something that has a lot of different uh, meshes and things like that, you want to make sure that, you know, you know what composes what, what makes what in this model. So that's kind of important, too. And especially if you're working in a studio, right? Um, even for yourself, too, I think it's a good practice to rename objects and uh 
if we were to do some baking uh, and baking is a, I don't want to get too technical, but basically what baking is, is that we would make a very high poly, very detailed version of this hammer. And we would have a low poly version, which is kind of what we have here. And then we would bake, like literally, we would like transfer the details of a high poly mesh into a low poly mesh. And AAA Studios use that very often to get away with, you know, having a really nice detailed model that looks very nice, but it's actually using a very low poly uh, version where the player will see it, right? So that's done through texturing. That's done in Substance Painter as well, which we'll take a look a little bit later. And uh, indie games kind of used it sometimes, you know, for, for the most part, that's a long uh, process, you know, and that's really not the objective here, at least in this case of this uh, hammer. The the whole point here is trying to like show you that you can make something that looks really cool, that is usable in a, in a game, and you can get away with just making it quick and still achieving a great result. So right now, I'm just kind of unwrapping this model. Unwrapping is, um, we touched on this very briefly yesterday, but uh, essentially what it is, is uh, imagine that this is a three-dimensional object, right? And if you need to do the texturing for this, you're gonna use image files. And image files are 2D uh, objects, I guess. It's a 2D plane. So you need to unwrap. So imagine, you know, when you are you are in a kindergarten or like you're starting school, and then they teach you how to glue a die, you know, like six-sided six die. You just go and glue the, the extremities, the edges, right? But before it came in a piece of paper that you have to cut. So that's essentially what it what this really is. So a cube is easy to visualize, but Thor's hammer, you might require a little bit more to do. So you have to unwrap the, the model to make sure that the texture that will go into it later looks fine. And it's not the most exciting process, I guess I like it at this point because I'm. that means that I'm done with the model. I'm almost there to start working on texture, which is probably the most fun part. But it's not exactly the, the most fun part of 3D. But very necessary, very important, and it's something that you can't skip, right? And we do cover how you do it properly in the course. But just as an example here, I'm just doing a very quick unwrap of this model so we can bring it later to substance painter and then we start working on the texture and you got to go on each of them there's no way around it i mean i guess there is some ways that you can go around it there are some options that you can do unwrapping uh with just a few clicks and it will give you an okay-ish result. But, you know, if you're planning to do some texturing later, say in Photoshop, for example, so you're manually painting those textures, you want to make sure that you're doing this unwrapping correctly because otherwise you, it's, you're going to get in trouble. You're going to like, oh my God, where is this? Where is that? And like now I'm trying to paint and I'm hitting a different face that I didn't mean to. So... Unwrapping is important. Knowing what you're doing is important. And uh, and I guess that's for everything in 3D, really. But especially in this, it's, uh, it's very important. You can have an awesome model, super detailed model. And you put a lot of love and, you know, sweat and tears as well into that model. And then if the unwrap doesn't match the quality of that modeling, then that's it. It's compromised. You know, you just messed up big time. So here, you know, I'm bringing the, the Thor's hammer into Substance Painter. And as you briefly saw there, um, I have already like the detailing, like the engravings and like, all that uh, stuff that is really cool from the hammer uh, prepared in Photoshop. I had to trace over some images for that. Some of them were found on online as well. So definitely credits to the people that did that for us. But, you know, uh, with something like this, you know, it's I guess it's totally OK. And now we're just doing the texture right so i'm using you know if you were here yesterday i'm just using some of the the basic materials that come with substance right and then just applying changing up the scale to make sure that it matches what we needed to be here and uh it's not really that hard it's just like uh just having an eye for it and having a good reference as well so you, you're trying to 
to match what you what you had there originally uh, as best as possible. And you know, if you want to make the hilt metal instead of leather, go for it, right? It's whatever you're trying to to achieve at the end of the day. But uh, the idea here is trying to to get as close as possible, I guess. And we're not trying to do a super realistic version of it. Um, just something that is quick, again, that you can do in like maybe 20 minutes on Substance, on Substance Painter if you know where to go, right? And that's something that we're also going to be covering up uh, later. But essentially, the way it works is just like Photoshop. And you have right here on the top, you have all these layers, you know, and you're going to be working with those layers. You're going to be adding other details on top of the other one. There's different blending modes. So if you're familiar with Photoshop, you can do multiply, you can do screen. You can change a lot. Like you can, there's so much you can do with substance to achieve great results quickly. And I can't stress enough how important it is to to learn this. You know, thankfully, uh, Adobe lets you uh, try it out for three uh, for 30 days, which is great. So it's something that you can download today. You know, if you if you are into the course or you just want to mess around with it, it's something that you just could do. And if it's if it is a thing for you and you can see the benefit that it will bring to your project, then by all means, you know, do what you you think it's best. You know, you just add some dirt, some grime. You know, it doesn't. Not everything needs to look super clean. Um, you want to make sure that you're adding a little bit of that into into your model to make sure that it, it's been places, right? Thor Sammer has been using it for a couple of years. It's uh, it's one of those things that uh, I think any object would have. Nothing is 100% clean. Even if it's brand new, you're going to see some imperfections here and there. And in this example, like I said, it's not realistic. We're not trying to be super exaggerated about the realism, but just to showcase what you can get out of the package with, uh, with just a little bit of modification on Substance Painter. And I think we're almost there here with this model. Yeah, I just wanted to make those extruded face a little bit darker because that's how it is on the reference as well and that was just like me grabbing a layer of metal that i made earlier and just changing the color to be a little bit darker right so super easy so another cool thing about substance is that you can take those grayscales of black and white images and then you can just literally paint on on your model just like that and a lot of people would either, you know, maybe sculpt those details using a sculpting tool. Even Blender has some of that as well. But uh, if if you if you want, like low on the budget or like you need to be quick about this, you can just use an alpha, like a grayscale image of whatever is the detailing that you have. You just plug that into Substance Painter, and you have a brush, and then you can just paint those directly into the model. And in this particular case, I'm not trying to be 100% precise about it because, you know, I assume the Thor's hammer was made by, I don't know, some dwarves or something like that. And they were like, you know, manually making this, right? To, they're crafting this thing uh, uh, manually. So, like, it doesn't need to be super precise about it. But there are ways for you to have precision when adding those details as well. I believe we should be getting to the final touches here. Sometimes you need a few clicks to get there too, but as long as you're patient and you are, you're looking to have the best uh, possible uh, result that you can. And there you go. That's Thor's hammer for you. And with a little bit of modification, you know, and you know, lighting and just setting it properly in a game engine, you can have something that looks amazing, right? Something that looks really, really cool. I'm using this on Marmo set right now, but. You can set it up in Unity as well, and it will look very similar to this. And you have an a, almost premium, you know, almost triple A looking like asset to use in your game. And you've done that in about an hour in condensed right now here, 20 minutes. But, you know, if you know what to do and where to go, you just you just can do it. It's just that simple. And that's it for Thor's Hammer. Hope you guys enjoyed it. That's so impressive. I mean, I'm looking at it right now. I, I, what's Marmoset, by the way? 
Marmoset is a, it almost works as a, <laughs> it's not an engine, but it's like a visualization uh, platform where you can like render, you can make renders of videos or renders of images. So it's a great way for you to yeah. showcase your 3D work. Yeah. That's so cool. Like in, in what I've learned guys um, with 3D and I'm, I'm not nearly as talented as Felipe in the art modeling side of things. I tend to sp spend a lot of my time inside of Unity. But what I've learned is that a lot of this stuff is magic. It's 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 like magic. There, it looks like it took a week to create because of all of these beautiful. Look at the highlights on there. The what's called bloom, a lot of the lighting effects, the post processing effects here. You can do a lot of what's in Marmoset inside of Unity as well. And what we've just seen is, you know, and in, in actual time, this was about an hour of Felipe's day. And so I think it's important to note that it's kind of like learning to drive stick, like we talked about yesterday. I remember when I was younger, when I was like 13 years old and I saw people driving, adults driving, I thought I'll never be able to do that. That looks so complicated. But once you learn the basics, all of a sudden it becomes, you know, second nature. It's just something that you know how to do. And so that sort of leads me to my next point here is if you're interested in learning the basics and honestly, everything that Felipe did here, you're going to be able to learn. If you want to do that, we have a new program called 3D Art Pro. And it is 40% off right now. So basically almost half off. This is because it's an early bird launch discount. This course took us about six months to create. So we're thrilled to offer it for 40% off. And you're also going to get my program 2D Art Pro. It's my brand new program about 2D art. You're going to get that totally free. Now, admittedly, there's 200 seats available and they're selling out way faster than we thought they would. So yesterday we launched and there's about, I think there's like 64 seats left. Um, so we're way more than halfway there. Um, so if you guys are interested in joining, click uh, below and, and you'll be able to, to enroll in this program and learn how to create something like Thor's hammer. Um, in the course, we actually create a beautiful sword. Um, so really quick, I just want to let you know the things that we're going to cover inside of 3D Art Pro. Um, Felipe covers blender modeling. He covers substance painter. That's what he was in just now, uh, before he entered Marmoset. Um, and also he covers humanoid models, how to rig them, how to weight paint them so that you can move their arms around. And then the big one here is architecture. And this is having a very, a various modular assets that you've created inside of blender, bringing them into unity, snapping them into place and almost like Minecraft or Legos building let's say a house or a castle. And that's what he, he's doing for father, um, my next game. What I cover in the course is Unity Terrain, Photoshop texturing. And then I also just break down the, sort of do a flyover of all of these elements. So me and Felipe, just like we do with our studio and making video games, we tag team and we focus on teaching what we know best, all right? And so we cover all of this and we also cover asset flipping. This is something I'm really passionate about. Uh, you don't need to worry about asset flipping being a dirty word. Uh, you don't need to feel bad for asset flipping. In fact, I would argue most indie game developers at some point will asset flip. For those of you who don't know, asset flipping is when you take pre-made models and you also maybe include some models that you've created custom and then you bring them into Unity which is again, it's kind of like Unreal or it's any, any game development tool out there. It's very similar. You bring all those in and you tweak the textures in Photoshop or maybe you tweak the shaders in Unity, change the colors, make it work within your own world. That's asset flipping. Believe it or not, you can create a whole entire world with no modeling skills. I certainly want you to know what Felipe knows, but if you're like me, when you first started out in 3D, suddenly you'll you'll realize i don't need to know anything about 3d art i i can actually just use assets and create my own world there's plenty of games out there in fact a buddy of mine made a good chunk of cash making a game with just flipped assets and then finally with the course you're going to get access to all the models and files right to study use them as reference these are reviews for my current program called full-time game dev i have over 3,000 students worldwide I'm really lucky, really blessed to have so many students, uh, definitely humbled and great reviews. So I can't put any reviews up currently for the 2D course or the 3D course because it just launched. But my assumption is 
this course is very similar in quality to full-time game dev, my bigger program. And these are the reviews for my bigger program, guys. So we have a lot of students worldwide, 3,000 plus students. So if you want to join, click the link, 40% off. There's only 64 seats left, um, at least the time of recording this video. And also you're going to get 2D Art Pro, which is my 2D program, completely free. So you can master 3D Art and 2D Art with, honestly, a heavily discounted launch early bird discount. So thanks for showing up, guys. It was really fun and great job, Felipe. Really, really impressed with what you got, man. Really, really smart guy. I'm so glad that uh, he enjoyed it, and hopefully our audience enjoyed it as well. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I actually got a little nerdy and excited last night and was listening to Neil Gaiman's uh, Norse mythology, but he has the whole story about the dwarves making Mjolnir. <laughs> Yeah, was, there you go. I was nerded out for today because I knew you were gonna do that. But that's I, something I, that I've I've nice. really enjoyed about Felipe working with Felipe. He, like, it, I was watching that and I was just chuckling because I was thinking he could have just followed the reference, but he had to do it right. And he does the same thing with Father. We're in a Victorian era in the game, and so he's hyper. Well, Thomas, that doesn't look Victorian. I'm like, okay, ah. well, if you want to make it Victorian, do your thing. <laughs> right. So he's yeah. very specific and I love it. <laughs> well, it's cool how easy it is to to pull those like like you were saying Felipe, there's like all of these designs and stuff so you have so many resources like at your disposal. Um and I I wanted to ask just a couple questions about the course before we dive into some questions we had from the audience and I had a couple as well, but um, um as far as just the course itself, is it a lifetime access? What's the process for students getting into it? Yeah. Is it like go at your own pace? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Lifetime access, guys. You, you can have this thing in perpetuity. And if any, if recent courses that I do are any indication, there's going to be more content. Um, so it's, I usually do about two content updates a year for all of my programs. This one will probably have updates. Um, you get all those free. I mean, it's, I'm not going to charge you. And then also you get a private discord community. Um, very active. We had hundred, you know, 130, no, 120 students show up yesterday. Nah, um, that's so, cool. Crazy, so it was man. like a flood of new students. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's great private discord community and it's, you know, it's kind of sad. It's a weird thing, but when you have a paywall for, for a community, it, there's there's a there's a ton of intention there because people actually are like they're willing to pay to be part of a program and so everyone's really really helpful it's so funny my mods rarely ever do anything um so i mean it's a it's really helpful community and i feel bad because they usually answer all the questions me and Felipe don't know <laughs> So but that's a, but that's great. And so that community, I think that's so valuable for something like yeah. this. So people are sharing stuff, commenting on each other's stuff. Like it's a space to just yep. talk about everything around, around the process. 2DR and 3DR and they're separate channels for each one. So that's super cool. Yep. Uh, well, uh, we had a couple questions from the audience and I wanted to lead with a couple that I had for Felipe while I was, while I was watching you, but uh, mm -hmm. Right off the bat, I work more in the audio field, um, so it's a little different, but I wanted to like target if you could say like two or three, if you're opening Blender for the first time, what are like the two or three basic either tools or like processes that someone should learn that are like re repeatable skills that you're going to use in almost everything you mm. do? Mm. Or it can be uh, yeah. one, you know, whatever, but like those basic there's, things, you know. There's so many, but ba in terms of basics, um, it's really understanding, uh, you know, how to manipulate. Um, that's a weird word to use it, but it really is. Manipulating in the sense of like moving things around and changing them, uh, the basic shapes that come with. And that's, the same, that's transferable for any 3D application, right? So if you understand how to make the best use of those ba basic operations like extrude, inset, bevel, and like loop cuts, that's the first big step, you know, like, and I like to believe 3D, you know, you have like, like every skill, you have those steps, you just keep going up and up and up. Mm -hmm. I think that's the very first one. You, yeah. If you practice around with, the, with those things, and you, you start playing around like, hey, I'm going to make this microphone. This is a cylinder, right? This mm -hmm. is a cylinder. This is mm -hmm. a cylinder, you know? Maybe I do a little bit of inset here to or bevel to make it a little bit smoother, you know? Like, 
you already have everything you need there, right? It's just how complex or how realistic you want that to be. And that's where you're going to be adding more to your skills. That's the next steps later, right? Mm. I think that's, yeah. that will be the, the ultimate one, I think, to yeah. me. Uh, aside from unwrapping, I know there's some questions about that too, but yes, that's yeah. important. Yeah, too. <laughs> well, we could dive right into that. Uh, uh, Deepu was saying unwraps are a nightmare to me, and <laughs> any basic steps to get a good unwrap? Yeah, you know, it's uh, that was certainly a step for me to really learn how to do unwrapping correctly, and uh. The first thing is be patient. Uh, it takes a long time to get it right and making sure that your texture is going to be applied correctly to the model. Uh, I think you pick up a couple of things along the way as you make mistakes too. And that's, I think, the same for anything that you make. But I think the most important things for you, if I can give any basic steps, is that if you're working on something that is not organic, let's say it's an object like a furniture, like what we call in the industry hard surface uh, hard surface modeling. Uh, you want to be mindful of angles that are too different from one another. So if you have, how can I do it? So you have something that is like have a like a ninety degree different angle, or maybe even sixty. Usually, you want to unwrap those faces separately. So you want to select this face here first, unwrap it so it's perfectly placed into a plane. This one here, you want to unwrap it separately. Because when it becomes a texture that goes around it, you want to make sure that edge is valued, right? So that's a very important thing for you to know. And that's going to reflect a lot on your in your texturing later as well. For organic, you want to take a look at like real life examples. I think that's probably the easiest way. So for example, a character, the way I learned it is that think of a shirt, right? Uh, how usually a shirt is made. So you have a seam that go around for like the sleeves. You have maybe a, a, sling, a seam that goes around here all the way to the waist. And that's how you're going to cut to later unwrap these models because they will connect in those ways, right? And that's probably the best way that I can think of right now. Yeah. I love that. I, I get like it, from getting into audio, when you do, you start just like he listening to everything around you even just like in a park and stuff and it seems like as a 3d artist you start just like oh how the hell is this table built <laughs> like what is how are all these things around me made what are the shapes i i love that yeah. so much and, well, let me um, encourage you guys yeah. really quick if you don't mind um something to keep in mind and this is this is something i've learned because i'm definitely not at the place felipe's in that's why i hired him um but what I'm learning and what I've learned about 3D modeling is there is a right way to do things, but there's also reason to not always do it right. Mm. Instead, it's better to just get it done. We talked about this yesterday. Um, Felipe, I mean, he knows the right way to do things for sure. But Felipe, I, I'm, I'm sure you would agree here. Maybe you don't. I'd love to ask you. Um, do you feel like there's... What, what you would call gatekeeping in the 3D community, where there's always a better way to do something and there's always people sort of putting down other methods of doing things? Mm. That's a very interesting question. Um, I, I It's kind of hard to say gatekeeping, but maybe a little bit. I think there are, uh, it, it's it's one of those things that is, it's, it's just a little bit difficult to figure out one way to do things, but there are certainly yeah. better ways to do it. Yeah. And I think sometimes also depends on how they learn things, if it was not the best way. But yeah, it took me a long time, for example, to find a course that teaches the right way on quote unquote, or like the most eff effective and efficient way and uh, or learn from the right teacher or mm. right instructor. Right. So uh, hopefully now what you get from, from us is like the amalgamation of, of like years of like doing things wrong or not so good or not the best way. But, you know, at the end of the day, if you need to just deliver something, you, you know, you, you, you have a deadline and things like that, as long as it doesn't look wrong, as long as, as long as it's not broken, it's okay. You know, like, uh, <laughs> you, you posted a video yesterday, I think it was yesterday about a father and the development of it. And yeah. so how sometimes things look a little bit broken because, you know, 
we got to just finish that. We just got to yeah. have it on time. And the player will never see it. So, you know, it's not affecting performance. Player is not going to be like, oh, this this is super wrong. No, it's fine. So yeah. don't let that be, you know, don't let that be a, something, an impediment, right? Something that yeah. will stop you from achieving what you want to achieve. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that you're totally right. It's one of those things where uh, maybe industry veterans who were making games in the, or 3D models in the 90s, if they heard what we're saying now, which is just get it done, they would be like, no, 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 you can't do that. But now you kind of can, you you really can in a lot of contexts with the way technology is now. Um, you can you can do a pretty crappy job underneath the hood, but the game runs pretty good, especially like on a, a gaming PC. Now with Nintendo Switch or mobile, you need to be careful. Like you mm -hmm. you should really be careful, especially with like like you were saying back faces and polygon poly count. All of that is really important. But generally speaking, to sort of wrap up this question, no pun intended, about unwrapping, um, <laughs> you, if you're doing an unwrap wrong, it should not stop you from moving forward, obviously continuing to learn, because eventually you do want to mm. do it right. But don't let it stop you from creating your world and finishing your 3D world. There's a lot of stuff in Father right now that's currently at GDC. Our game is at GDC. If I showed you, this is this is a result of me, not Felipe. But if you look at some of those models, especially the enemies, there's a ton of unwrapping issues. But it didn't stop us from continuing to make a game that we believe will be profitable. If our, if my, if our previous games are any indication, it's going to be a profitable commercial release. But... My poor unwrapping skills did not stop me from moving forward and finishing. Thomas, they're not I, bad. Yeah, they're not bad. I just wanna just wanna say. <laughs> yes, they are. You know they are. They're okay. I'm just saying that. <laughs> <laughs> I I appreciate Thomas. Every event, you're always so honest about that stuff. That's so valuable. Because well, I when I'm those... selling something, I like to be honest because I always feel gross selling something. So I'm yeah. like, I want to be honest and let everybody know what I teach. My focal point in this program is. How to bring stuff into Unity and make a game, get it done, right? Yeah. Whereas Felipe, this is why I love working with Felipe. We're, we're yin and yang. I mean, he he's so particular and precise, and I can't think of a better person to teach modeling. Um, so we've got a really good relationship, and I think that that's how your brain should be. It should be, I need to do this right. I need to be technically excellent. But the other side of your brain says, but we got to get this done because we're not AAA. We don't have a million-dollar budget. I got to get this game done, you know? Well, and, and I, I just appreciate so much the the philosophy of getting better by finishing a whole thing. Yeah. It's so easy to get wrapped up in a little detail and just work and work and work and never actually finish the like bigger picture. But yep. you're done with it. I think you said this in the first event we did. It's like, put out a game. It's going to be shit. You're going to get a bunch of hate. The next one's going to be better, right? But yeah. you've done the whole thing. And I, I just appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The done is better than perfect. Don't right? get wrapped up. Yeah. In your unwraps. <laughs> uh, them. Got, of course, got I know that Felipe does get wrapped up in his unwraps. He's right. like hyper focused. But, but there's uh, a time for that, right? There's a, there's a time yeah. for that. And there's a skill level for that. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Now, if you, if you guys are just like, hey, I want to learn this. And, and I'm not making a game, then learn it right. You know, do it right. Um, but I know a lot of you guys watching are probably currently working on a game. And you're thinking, oh, man, Felipe's so good at this. I want to go back in all my models and unwrap them correctly and use Substance Pan and all that. I just want to encourage you, no, get it done. You know, re release your game with the terrible unwraps and the terrible texturing. Get it done. You can worry about it in your next game, right? Mm -hmm. It, it, this this insecurity always stops us from actually making progress so don't let that insecurity stop you it it's really important to watch people like felipe um be, it, me myself included it's really important for me to go man i have so much so much room to grow but at the same time i'm running this studio and i i, I don't want to run it into the ground and so what i do is i say well you know what we're doing great felipe's doing a great job but there are some models in here that we just need to, we need to ship and that's the way it's got to be. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Love it. Uh, I wanted to get to just a couple more questions sure. here while we still have time. Uh, 
Jeremy was asking, could you recommend any good UV plugins that are helpful? It's a good thing you mentioned that. Uh, yeah, one of the, the plugins we recommend is uh, Text Tools. It's uh, it's the same one that I use for 3ds Max uh, when I use the, that software because I come from a 3ds Max background, and uh, yeah, it's fantastic. There are a couple other ones. Uh, I think Blender probably have their own library of options as well. I like to keep it simple because here's the thing, and this is actually a, a, a there's a good segue to this question as well. I think is um, when it comes to add-ons, there are some amazing add-ons on Blender that literally you just click one thing and boom, there you go. You generate some crazy stuff and saves a bunch of time. But here's the thing. If you get dependent on an add-on and suddenly that person, that author of that add-on decides to, I don't want to update this add-on anymore. You know, I, yeah. I'm just tired. I want to move on to something else. You're screwed now because... <laughs> You need to learn how to do it, you know, from scratch, you know, and uh, so don't depend too much on add-ons. Uh, the the one that we we talk about in the course, but even this Thor's hammer, I didn't use any add-ons for for this Thor's hammer, and for the most part, even on 3ds Max, I don't use add-ons either, except for text tools, because what text tools offers is very simple. It's just some quality of life improvements. So don't get too dependent on add-ons, especially in the beginning. Learn the the right way, the the traditional way first. And then if you dominate that and you just want to feel like, man, I just don't want to waste too much time, then yeah, then by all means, use what's available there. I think Text Tools is a great option uh, to get started. And it's a good entry, not too dependent uh, add-on for you to use. I love it. Uh, we got to wrap up soon here for time, but there was one more question I had, uh, which was coming from a totally different world, but I got a little into 3D because I got a 3D printer from a friend. And so it's just starting to play around. I awesome. know, it, it, which is so fun. But I know in that world, there's a lot of marketplaces and stuff where you can give away for free or sell your 3D models and stuff. And I found incredible value just by putting my total crap designs out there, but just to see what people would say or download or how they modified it. Is there a place like that for gaming where you can also just take these assets you're creating Maybe people will use them. Maybe you can sell them, but you can start, even if you're not designing a whole game, you can start taking these things on your computer and throwing them into the wild to start like just getting a feel for like how people interact with them. Yes. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but I'll tell, I'll, I'll say a few and then Felipe, I'm sure you have a few that you like to reference. I mean, it's, it's endless. Uh, mm. the, the places that you can sell your resources. Maybe not endless, but close. I mean, there's a lot of places. Uh, Unity Asset Store, we're, we're about to launch um, something called the Classic FPS Pack. It includes, it's more of a code base, but it, we're actually using this code base for Father, um, our next game. So you could, there's just a ton of assets that you can sell there. Um, what about you, Felipe? Yeah, for 3D specifically, you can find things like uh, Sketchfab, um, Turbo Squid, you have ArtStation is fantastic because uh, Epic Games acquired uh, ArtStation and they have a huge market there. In fact, whenever I'm really looking for a, a specific material for Substance Painter or some reference models or something like that, I go to ArtStation, for example. And of course, on, uh, Unity Asset Store, Unreal Marketplace, those are great venues for you to put your art out there, you know, and make some passive income, you know, like it's... Uh, it's great. You know, you should take advantage of that. Something to think about, guys, is, Flippy, would you be here had you not uploaded your stuff to the assets? Store? Yes, that's a great yeah. point. Thomas met me because I had some uh, weapons, some like AAA esque ah. weapons uh, in the Unity Asset Store. And uh, he saw that, emailed me, hey, you know, how about you make some guns for this game that I'm making, Father? That's like a year ago, I guess, or more. Yeah. And then we started in touch, and there you go. Now I'm working at Thomas Studio. So, yeah, yeah and it, it's a kind of exposure that you probably want to have, and uh, just to get stuff out there. Of course, you know, it's all about honesty as well. What you present on your models, make sure that it's good quality and all that, and uh, so that it reflects on your name, right? I mean, I, I'm guessing Thomas wouldn't have messaged me if he didn't see like, hey, you know, this guy can do. Mm -hmm. good stuff right so yeah. uh so make sure that you're doing that but yeah you know try it out that's so cool uh, 
that's exactly why I asked the question because it's yeah. it's so easy to sit there with just all this stuff on your computer and it, and be scared to put it out there but that's the so ultimate the, the yeah. really the the theme of this little story here is that Felipe wasn't scared to put his stuff out there uh, and guys you just shouldn't be scared you know if, even if you've designed a really crappy turd and you've uploaded it to turbo squid great it's just one step closer to getting exposure um so i know that for me i'm always nervous about launching anything so i've launched video games i've launched online courses i've launched youtube channels i've launched a ton of things felipe's launched his assets he's got his you know our demo at gdc none of these things i i'm feeling confident about every time I launch something, I feel very unconfident, very <laughs> insecure and almost fraudulent because of the, um, the, the, whatever it's called, the imposter syndrome, imposter syndrome which everybody yeah. talks about. Well, you know, ultimately there's no real way to get around it. The only, the only way you don't really get around feeling that way. It sort of sticks around forever. But what you do do is you take online courses, for example, or you, talk to friends or you say, Hey, can you mentor me? And you release content. You just release, 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 release. I mean, Edmund McMillan who made uh, super meat boy released a bunch of terrible games before he actually was successful. So if you're thinking right now, I'm not a 3d modeler, I can't do that. Or my parents said this, or my, my brother said that, or this friend said that about my skill. It's all BS until you actually just go for it and try it and start mm. releasing stuff. Um, so that's sort of the, I guess, a good conclusion there. Just, yeah. Just get stuff done and release it. If, well, if I can just add to one thing about that, because yeah. I really like what you said. You know, a lot of people get into this business and they, if you're not super young, maybe you're like your you're early 20s, you know, you're, you kind of have to pay rent, maybe, I don't know or you're doing something completely different maybe you took different school maybe you didn't even take school at all and that's fine you know but you have to fend off you got you got to survive right and 3d like you're interested in that it's kind of like a hobby but you kind of want to turn that into a, a, a profession and i'm sure thomas talked a, a lot about that too because he had that journey i think right thomas you you worked on different things before yeah. right yeah Just like i mean me. i had a desk right? job for three years and me, me too right yeah and you know the, the, the idea here is that practice a little bit every day, you know, and just do that. Put your assets out there. Keep releasing stuff. Build that thick skin. Uh, it's hard for me, man. Like uh, uh, every artist, you know, Thomas, you know, Jonah, like everybody here, like we have to deal with that. Just putting ourselves out there is so hard. And a lot of it is new to me as well. So you uh, just do it. You know, the rewards are better than the, the negatives, right? There's always going to be people that are going to, talk bad stuff about what you do and, and all that. But, you know, just keep doing it. Push yourself there. And suddenly, you got to be like me. You're going to be part of the code, you know? And, uh, and you just if that's what you love, then just, just keep doing it. You know? I right. love that. That's great. Love it. I, we unfortunately have to wrap up for the day, but what a great note to end on. And for everyone watching, please hop in the comments, show your appreciation for Thomas and Felipe. We are going to dive in again tomorrow. And uh, tomorrow, as I understand, we're diving more into Unity mm -hmm. and we're going to be hopping into that as a tool and expanding on that. And yep. Just to make sure everyone knows, it will be a separate YouTube page. So head over to the Spotlight YouTube channel, or if you already are RSVP to the Spotlight event, you'll get a notification there. And if you had a good time today, please like and subscribe to the Spotlight channel as well. We're trying to consistently bring content like this to you so you can grow in all your skills and hobbies. And was there anything else you gentlemen want to say before we head out today? No, it was fun. I had a good time. Love Me it. Too. Thank you so both so much for joining us, and we'll see you tomorrow, same time, same place. Thank you, everyone in the audience. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, guys. Cheers, guys.